Divine Truth Assistance Group Group Assistance Sessions Putting Principles of Divine Truth into Action This recording is from the Understanding God's Loving Laws Group and is part of an Education in Love series. In the Human Transformation Principles presentation, Jesus briefly summarizes God's principles of human transformation that govern the operation of God's laws and determine the human soul's future potential, and gives examples of the way these principles are built into God's laws. Recorded on the 12th of November, 2016, in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. Okay, so here we go. We're here discussing this time human transformation principles, the most exciting and complicated principles of the universe. Yeah. Yeah. When you start looking at transformation, uh, there's amazing things that go on in transformation. So there's so many things I'd like to say here and I'm really not sure how we're going to go covering a lot of it. So we'll see how we go. Okay, let's get started. Okay. Hierarchical universes can be constructed, each one governing and containing multiple universes of the lower hierarchical type. Now, in your outline and on the board here, you notice there's a bit I missed out previously existing. Cross that out, because they don't have to be previously existing. So, let's cross that out. But other than that, the hierarchical universes... Okay, so, so here what we're doing, remember Mary introduced to you, I'll just jump to this slide. Um, Mary introduced to you um, this slide here. Remember that? Yeah. Have you got a soul layer? You've got a soul layer of laws, a soul layer of universe, a physical layer of laws, a physical layer of universe, the laws, of course, containing the universe that's under them. Does that make sense? So when we go back to this other slide, which I now have to jump back to, and uh, wrong way, other way, go back to that first slide. What we're saying there is that hierarchical universes can be constructed, can be. Remember, they may not exist yet, even. They can be constructed, each one governing and containing multiple previous existing universes. So what that really looks like is at the moment there are, um, with, from memory I think it's around six or, or seven, but I can't remember the actual number, whether, whether it is six or seven, but um, there, is, there are basically six Earths at this stage. Six areas of the, in, in different universes that actually contain Earth and Earth with people on them. Do you follow? Okay, so, so we draw them, we draw the Earth as a cluster, so there's a cluster of Earths. Right? They're all contained in a they, they, the physical universe, of course, has the spiritual sides to them, and so we now have spheres around each one of those Earths. So we can call them spheres, but they actually exist as um, you could s- liken them to be sort of like pieces of an orange, right? All the spheres. Now, there are multiples of seven, so, so you have sort of a spheres of an orange encapsulating. These are all the spheres encapsulating this partic- these, these Earths, each one of them, uh, oh sorry, I've probably done, done that wrong, because each one of them actually is encapsulated like that. So here's one Earth and here's another Earth with those spheres encapsulating around it, right? And so forth, right? And they go together in a cluster, um, and this, these spheres go up to thir- 35 in number on around each one. Right, and they are in a cluster then. So if you draw that cluster, it's like the Earth with its spherical cluster, another Earth with its spherical cluster, and so forth, up to 36 spheres, 35 spheres, sorry. So like that, six or seven of them. And then that's contained by the laws that govern the physical. You follow? They are equal in status and nature. They do the same job. This now is a layer, the physical laws, 
govern what happens within this structure. Right? Now, you can see that if we rub those out, there, must prob there probably is um, clusters of these as well, right? right? And they are contained by the soul universe where all the souls exist. At the moment, um, as far as we're aware, there's just one of them. But that doesn't mean that that's the only one. It just means that that's what we're aware of. Right? And the soul universe is governed by, of course, a structure of laws that control it. Just as we had on our diagram. But you need to understand there's clusters in amongst all of that. So, so wh why I point that out to you is that uh, you need to understand that this is not the only Earth that has people on it. Right? There are other places in the universe that have people on them and they all form a part of this universal structure. Does that make sense? I don't want to get bogged down in that because there's more important things to discuss. So I wanted to illustrate to you though the physical universe which I've illustrated here. So this physical universe, this physical universe consists of six or seven clusters of 35 spheres each with an Earth as its core. Do you follow? Where all the people come from and incarnate. So they need a place of incarnation and then a place of development on Earth. And then after they pass in the spirit world, a place of development on Earth until they reach uh, the awareness of the soul-based universe. The soul-based universes, potentially, right? Because God's infinite, probably more than one. And then, of course, who knows? There might be clusters of those even. Who knows? Also, we've talked about the soul existing here. Has the soul exists there with an energetic control over what happens to the bodies in this area. Does that make sense? These bodies are joined to this soul. The soul basically encapsulates them. Now, how I'm drawing it is not how it really is either because... It's multi-dimensional. So with multi-dimensional universes, a dimension can exist within other dimensions. Right? In other words, can even take up the same space as the dimensions underneath it. Right? So it's not like drawing... You can't draw it like this, really. But I'm just trying to illustrate sort of how, conceptually, how it might work, how it works from from a perspective of trying to ba in, in, illustrate rather than actually... If I could make some kind of multidimensional universe in front of you as a 3D hologram, that would be wonderful, but even that wouldn't be a way of representing it because multidimensions have multiple lots of three dimensions. So even that's going to be limited. So, so you see that a uh, multidimensional universe now makes it possible for a soul to encapsulate two bodies while existing inside or encapsulated by another type of a universe that is higher in its hierarchy. Right? Which is what I'm trying to illustrate. So we have physical universes which are the lowest based hierarchical universes and you can see now why I call them plural because there's many of them, you follow? So that's why there's a plural and they, they include the physical and the spiritual spheres that surround that physical universe. That, that's all considered to be one physical universe. Does that make sense? Yeah? Bruce, you would like to ask? If we just have a... Who's got the mic? So absorbed, so I'll share that. Yeah. <laughs> so these um, clusters, which had the Earth is the centre of each one, or a Earth is a it Earth. Earth, yeah. and they are all developed to 35 spheres? That, yes. So it, they, as one expands, they all expand, or are they all expanding together? No, no, as, uh, as one expands, it expands, but the, the pinnacle of its point of development is the th transition between, the aware between unawareness of the, 30 of the union condition and awareness of the union condition. So there's no right. need for a 36th sphere okay. in them. Does that make sense? Yep. yep. And because all of God's laws are permanent, the laws that govern the creation of each sphere around such Earth are completely governed by the first person who enters the condition of that. Okay. Does that make Thanks. sense? Yep. Yep. Clearer. So I have six friends. 
yeah, who so. have entered the same, who have done basically the same that I have done, being the first person to enter the specific, the next sphere, yeah. which creates the sphere. But there are a maximum of 35 in every one of them, because it's consistent. Does that make yep. sense? Yep. Yes. Yep. 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 So maybe if we go to Sherry on this side. Um, so are there other um, Earths where people have developed a lot more than us? Do you know, are we like barbarians? <laughs> <laughs> well, in comparison to the second sphere condition, we're like barbarians. Yes. Yeah. But that's the second sphere condition even just surrounding this Earth. Yeah. And, and they are yeah. universal places, are they not? So you've got to stop thinking of the spirit world as, I don't know what you think of it of as, but I, I, I know it's not what I think of it as <laughs> most of the time, because many of the questions you ask, I go, I know, surely that's self-evident, you know what I mean? The, the issue is, is that for, for many of us is we're not even seeing the second sphere of our, surrounding our own earth as a less as a, a much more loving state and therefore not a barbarian sort of a state. So of course it's the same, but the question you're really asking is on the earth of each one of these earths, you're really asking are they all in a similar state or are they all in a different state? Yeah, and have they all created hells like we have? In yes, that? yes they have. Yeah. They all have. Yep. Oh. And they're actually all in a similar state of having a return as well. Are they? From the first person who visited the whole, for up to the Union State. Yep. So they're all in a very similar place, which also makes sense, does it not? Because if you consider permanence and you consider scope and you consider all the other principles, there's a high likelihood that the application of those principles would be consistent across all earth would it not so yeah the reality is you can see that it's highly likely that very similar things are occurring at each in each place mm. now you. these are not the concept of parallel universes or anything like that you know none of, none of that's actually true so relief that means there's not a hundred of you in a hundred different earths all experiencing different things because of different choices there's none of that going on does that make sense? Mm, That's just a, one, of the, one of the theories that, ironically, all the Earths have come up with, but, <laughs> but it's not true. Okay, now we've got to be careful about getting God bogged down to questions. Here. Maybe if we go to Natalie, and that would be the last question until I move on to the next part. I thought the soul union was the 21st sphere. Is it, is it still that and then just... No, well, I've had since memories of it, of it being more than that. Every okay. seven spheres, there are multiples of what you receive from God and, we've, and I've started having memories about the different multiples and what different crap qualities of God you receive and so okay. it's turned out that I've remembered there's 35. It could be that there's more that I haven't remembered yet, of course, because okay. I'm yet in the state where I'm back, back in that direct connection with God so and direct connection even with my own soul remember I've said to you quite clearly that I'm in a five percent state probably yeah, yeah. so at the end of the day I might have more to tell you when I get into six <laughs> percent state and a ten percent state does that make sense yeah but these are the things I've remembered I'm only telling you the things I've remembered and I'm not telling you things I haven't remembered yet yeah does that make sense yeah yeah. And in relation to the universe, you're saying, like, I'm starting to grasp the concept of how my sin affects the universe. Yep. Because does my soul only operate on this earth and therefore only affect this universe, or does it affect the cluster? Well, look at the because drawing. It, it, yeah, it affects all where, of it. Where is the soul universe? So it affects everything. So I've met some of the people from the other earth. That's how I know there are people in the other earth, right? That's a lot of sin. So that tells you that there's the capacity, your soul even has the capacity to affect the other 35 dimensional states in the other earth. Now, of course, if you're in a first sphere condition, you're not affecting it very much, right? Because you have no power of governance or very little. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So a soul in this state 
has a much greater power of governance, therefore able to affect these things much more powerfully. But a soul in a first sphere condition in one of these Earths on the sphere, that soul in that condition is actually going to have very little power of governance and so the energy from its power of governance can't really infiltrate the other boundaries, you see. And, and even your energy, give, uh, in, if you're in a first fear condition, your energy can't even go beyond the first fear condition to influence the second sphere condition. That's how God's created it. Your power of governance isn't great enough to have governance over the second sphere condition. So if you're in a first fear condition in one of these Earths, you are only influencing the first fear condition in all the other Earths. You can't influence a second sphere condition in any of the other Earths. Do you follow me? Or yeah. even in ours, for that matter. Yeah. Because your power of governance isn't strong enough to cross those boundaries. Still matters, though. Still matters, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Which is why these Earths are in a very... One reason why these Earths are in a very similar state of development, because we have been influencing each other given our current condition. You follow that? Yeah. Hmm. So the beauty is of that is that God has allowed for one of these Earths to get into the first condition, and I can't remember which one it is. Probably wasn't me because I'm pretty slow sometimes. So, so it's probably some, one of the others that got into that condition, right? And they got into a condition that they went into the seventh sphere, eighth sphere, and that then influenced my ability to get into that condition. Does that make sense? And so forth. This is the beauty. It gives you multiple chances to achieve God's desired outcome. Right? Isn't that wonderful? Because it means you're not just limited to waiting for one person <laughs> to do it. There are people in different places all trying to do or achieve the same thing. And that means, of course, that you will eventually achieve the same thing. It's the more, the more people that are sharing and trying to uh, engage the common goal, uh, common goal, the more higher the likelihood of that is of that goal being achieved, is it not? So naturally that's going to be the case. Okay, well, let's get on to the transformation principle itself. <laughs> transformation is the potentiality offered to the human soul with sincere and passionate desire. You see that desire principle popping up again, right? To exceed its original created condition and potentials as a human and to allow God's personal love to be absorbed by the soul in order to transform the soul into an immortal divine creature with the potential of infinite expansion. That's what it is. When I say the potential of infinite expansion, obviously it will never be completely infinite because we are contained within the infinite being God. So, so, but we have the potential to approach infinite, which means we get the potential to be pretty huge, right, in amongst that creation. So, Now, obviously, they're going to be the most complex of all of God's principles because they engage, it, remember, the hierarchy of law. Every law of a higher law, every higher law is the amalgamation of all components of the laws underneath that higher law. So, so if we're talking about transformational principle, which allows these universes to be created even within the expanse of the infinite God, then we can see that obviously the transformational principles have actions upon billions and billions and billions of concurrent things at the same time. So therefore, they must be the most complex of all laws. Does that make sense? And you know what the irony is of all of that? God has made it so simple to understand and do, while at the same time, building the most complicated of all the possible laws that could exist. And it's just remarkable when you think about that. Because all you have to do is think about three or four primary things, which are the things I've been teaching you for years and years and years, right? and you're already engaging all of the laws that cause transformation without you having to know any single one of them really. That's the irony. So that, that's, a, that's remarkable in itself. God's made it that the most complicated thing in the universe to actually understand at a mathematical level is also simple enough for a child to engage emotionally. A five-year-old child can engage it emotionally. And yet, he might not understand it mathematically, 
for many, many, many centuries or millennia. Like I still don't understand it mathematically, 2,000 years old. Uh, very interesting, isn't it? So, what does it do? Transformation principles. They lay out desire-driven transformation from the human soul to the divine soul, to a divine, to a divine creature. And we call it divine because it, it's it received a part of God's nature, therefore received a part of the divine. So whenever you receive a part of God, you're now receiving a lot of things. You're firstly receiving a part of God's very personality and nature, God's feelings, but you're also receiving the gift of immortality at the same time. Because God, anything that belongs to God cannot be destroyed. Which means if it's inside of you, that you can't be destroyed. But anything that doesn't have a part of God inside of it, actually inside of it, can be destroyed. Right. So that's very interesting. We need to talk a bit more about that perhaps. Huh? Allow desire-driven absorption of God's attributes by the human soul. And this is a very remarkable thing when it comes to law. Remember, there's a layer, there's another layer here of God's principles, and then there's God's personality, and then there's God, right? The entity God inside of which we're all contained. And basically this is saying that a part of God's personality, God's attributes and desires, can, be, can transform across the universes and through all the laws and actually be absorbed by this soul. Now it makes sense if we're living inside of God that we must be able to absorb a part of God's nature at some point. right? But to allow the laws to do that is quite remarkable if you think about it. And it's driven by this, again, this key quality of desire. So important, desire. It allows the entire soul to join in full self-awareness. So without transformation, that would not be possible. Right? It assigns the gift of immortality to the human soul who transforms. Because we've now received a complete, uh, we've now complete, we've received a part of God's love a as a part of our nature inside of the actual entity, which is us. We now are unable to be destroyed. God even could not destroy us, because to do so, God would have to destroy a part of her love. Can you see? So even God could not destroy us in that place. Interesting thought. Jada, you'd like to ask? Um, how much of God's love do you have to receive for that? Like even if you've just received a little bit, are you then immortal? Yep. You can be in the hills, but you're not going to be conscious of your immortality, are you? But you can be in the hills and receive a little bit of God's love and now you are immortal, even though you're not conscious of it yet. And trust me, there's a big difference between feeling you're immortal mm. and actually having a part of God's immortality in you without knowing that. There's a huge difference between those two states. The joy of knowing you're immortal you, you, is like a, a state that is so difficult for any of you to imagine because there is no fear in that place, no fear about anything. You're not fear of, you don't fear death, you don't fear being hurt, you don't fear anything. You don't fear people, you don't fear places, you don't fear anything in God's universe at all. So you imagine that state where there's no fear at all within you and you know you can never die. So that's, that, that state is achieved in the union condition. Does that make sense? In between that time, although, although when I say that state's achieved in the, in the union condition, in the union state, the, the reality is when you become at one with God, what I've been terming at one with God in the eight sphere state, <laughs> as a, it, half of the soul, you become aware of that condition. So in other words, after the eight sphere, you have no fear. Everything's now after that driven by desire only. 
just how passionate are you to grow after that? But as a complete self-aware being, that happens in the 36th. The transition between the 35th and the soul union universe. Does that make sense? Yep. Hmm? Yes. Okay, can we just move on a little? The signs, the potential of infinite expansion and expression. Now this, is, this is an amazing potential. Potentially, the soul, like the reason why the soul universe was created by God in the first instance is because that's the only place where the soul can really survive. Right? And anything under it, all these physical places, are the only places where half of the soul in an unaware state can survive. Does that make sense? So that's why... Half of the soul in an unaware state needs a body and it needs a spirit body because it's in an unaware state of its complete union condition and it needs to develop awareness of that condition. And to develop awareness of that condition, it needs to grow from its unaware state to a state where it firstly connects to God completely and then next it needs to connect to its other half completely into an aware state. Once it's in this aware state, in this place here, it then also has the potential for infinite expansion beyond that place. Now what that means at this stage nobody really knows. But it could mean the creation of new universes to contain those particular beings, if we can call our own soul that. Right? And it could mean clusters of universes, um, soul-based universes that are, are actually happening, we, we don't know, that then merge in another condition. It could also mean that what we're now seeing as the soul and this is highly likely, by the way, that what we're now seeing as a soul is not our real self. You think about that? See, see when, you first, when you first came on this planet, you thought your physical body was your real self, did you not? And now you're learning that you have a spirit body, right? So then you think that that's your real self. So this is the condition that most spirits are in. They think that that blue one, the spirit... Part of their body is their real self, but they don't know that it's actually the... Well, there's also now we come aware that the half of the soul is our real self, and then we come aware, oh, that's not true either. That there's actually the other half of the soul, and that's our real self. Now, what's in an infinite universe with an infinite God? Do you think that's the limit? <laughs> Can you see what I'm saying? It's potentially, highly potentially, not the limit. So who knows, there might be a part of us that we're yet to actually become aware of that's much bigger than that, but we first need to actualize as that before we become aware of what we're actually, actually a part of. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that infinity means this, right? Yeah. So you can, the infinity principle, you can see why, you know, we could discuss the infinity principle, but we probably would have been here for the whole week by <laughs> just, just discussing that. So we needed to make sure we discuss the other things. But you can see that um, the potential of infinite expansion and expression um, is, is really a, a strong possibility. Yeah. So I'm resistive to change. Hmm. Seems to be a bit of a problem. <laughs> yeah. Now, if I can give you some examples. Prayer is an interesting example. God, the entity, has feelings. So remember the personality attributes of God we've put in a layer here, which would include God's feelings, would it not? All right. So God has feelings of some kind. Motions, in other words, of some kind. And when we pray... A feeling inside of this soul, even if it's one half of the soul, a feeling of one half of the soul could be, gets transmitted to God. And God responds to the feeling, if it's sincere, of course, based on truth and love, um, and gives love to that soul. Right? Now, for that feeling to exit the soul, and then it's got to go through beyond the, all the current known universes, through the principles of God, which govern its operation, 
and into God actually in order to get for God to receive it, does it not? Isn't that remarkable? If you think about it, it means that you're, we're transmitting feelings. Now, prayer is interesting in that if your previous concept of prayer, which was all about you know thoughts or, or those kind of things, um, words that you might say, but if, it, if it was, prayer was just governed by this physical universe, you could see there's a lot of problems, right? The nearest star is eight light years away, and let's say God was on, sitting on the nearest star, and, and we decided to have a prayer to God, being eight, years light, uh, eight light years away and being, un, and being bound by the physical laws, including the physical law of the transmission of time and space, uh, we'd, be, we'd be limited to light year being uh, uh, the speed of light being the limit of prayer. And so it would take eight years to get to God and eight years to come back. So you're 16 years older before you get an answer. It wouldn't be very effective, would it? It would be a terribly ineffective way of communicating with God. The beauty is that this is why you must learn to engage emotion. Because emotion transcends the boundaries of physical universes. It's just a minor point. <laughs> Can you, it is a major thing to understand. So you're so reluctant to feel emotion, and yet emotion is the only way you can leave here. Do you understand what I just said? So the only way you, a part of you, can leave here and actually enter God is emotion. So, so why are you resisting emotion so much? It doesn't make any sense to me. You see? It's so essential that you understand emotion because without, without emotion inside the soul, you've got no way of exiting uh, anything from you, exiting the universe and entering God. You, you, you've got no way of communicating with God how you feel. None at all. And if you're close to the reception of emotion, you have no way of being able to receive from God what he feels. None at all. Right? Very important to remember that. Raj, thanks. You'd like to ask? Um, thank you. So um, could you just explain perhaps where the Holy Spirit fits in relative to the transmission of the emotions to God and back? Sure. I, I define the Holy Spirit as a conduit that comes from God. And it's actually something in the soul space that you can actually see as a conduit. It's like a pipe. It's an energy conduit. You could think of it like almost as a wormhole if you were thinking in that kind of terminology. Mm -hmm. It's an energy conduit which things can pass through. Feelings can pass through. So God's created these energy conduits between God and us that are activated by our desire, which has to be pure and sincere, based on love and truth. And these energy conduits allow the flow of emotion from us to God and God to us. It's like an optical cable. Yeah, it's like an optical cable. It's like a like a fibre cable. And what would what would be the force that would drive the speed of that feeling through the cable? It's instant. There's no. It's, it's instant. An instant transmission. It's an instant transmission. The moment you have the feeling, in fact, it's not only instant, but God is aware of when you're going to have the feeling before you have one. So you've already dialed. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's really interesting. Mm. Yeah, and this is where, see, God is not bound as an infinite being. He's not bound by time. So he knows what's going to happen at any, at all instances in time. And, and then we start getting on the complicated subjects. But, mm. but the reality is God knows, well, it, like millions of years in advance, when you're going to have a feeling to connect to God. Not because it's predictable, but because God can, does, is not bound by the constraint of time that we are bound by as a soul. Does that make sense? So he is able to see in the moments in time when that will occur. And, and it's, not that it's, predict, it's not that it's uh, premeditated by God or anything like that. And just to follow on from there, you've said in the past this week, uh, we need to um, open a relationship with the Holy Spirit. No, the relationship's mm -hmm. not with the Holy Spirit, Raj. 
Well, the Holy Spirit is a conduit. It's, it's just right. a thing. It's a law, actually. You, you did it's law of transformation you guides did, it. Yeah, you did say something, I think, about um, having a, an awareness of the Holy Spirit, or well, you need to understand its operation. It's a right. truth-based operation. You need to be in harmony with truth. So it can only, but it's also desire-based operation. So it mixes or commingles, if you like, truth with desire, and and measures the desire that you have specifically for God mm. and that then that right. God is instant now the Holy Spirit is in connection with you the conduit is established oh. now things can flow between it right. does that make sense? Got it. Yep. thank you very much it's a physical thing it's not a it's not see people call it a person or whatever it's not a person it's a it's a physical law this law is it's actually the law of transformation at work it's part of the functions of the law of transformation, the principles of transformation. So the, the, the laws governing the function of the Holy Spirit are governed by transformation principles. That make sense? It's these principles that govern it, along with all the other principles, remember, too. None of these principles are like a fabric that operate upon every single being, every single creation in the universe. Yeah? They're not independently operating. They all work together. There are hierarchy of law, but they all work together to create the function. Remember, that's the principle of scope. Function of higher functions are created by the commingling of creations and the laws of a lower function. Transformation principles are the highest principles. Therefore, they must commingle lots of laws and lots of creation to make them, in order to make them work. Yes? And they actually involve some of God's personal energy and emotions. So therefore... They're, they exist without outside of the known universes. Mm. They are laws that govern that are, that govern the current known universes, and therefore exist outside of them. They are the framework for those universes to exist. Yeah. We're starting to get a little complicated now, right? Yeah. A bit too much for the mind to grasp. Is that right? I can feel everyone starting to go. So transformation principles enable laws governing prayer to exist and operate in and outside of the laws governing the universes. So you can see that transformation principles have to be some of the, well, are the highest laws currently known by humanity. They are the highest principles. They involve love and truth. Remember, love and truth is in each principle. But transformation principles govern a huge amount of things, including the very complex operations that occur between your soul and God's soul and the complex operations of what happens inside of your soul in the way that it receives God's love and what happens to the soul as a result of the reception of God's love and then what happens to the two bodies that are connected to the soul that receives that, that love as well. Right? And you imagine we talked about the physical laws governing the physical body. There's billions of them. So how many of them, how many of these laws do you think there must be governing these processes? Literally billions upon billions upon billions of them. Uh, hmm. Okay, we talked a bit about prayer and the nearest star and so forth. So let's look at the reception of God's love. God's love exists outside of all universes. God, love is an emotion, a feeling of God, therefore existing outside of all of God's universes, right? The universes are contained within God, but God's emotions are outside of those universes containing the universes themselves. So God's love exists outside of the universes, and yet transformation principles allow God's love to be received by self-aware beings inside the universes. Pretty amazing things, really, that it allows. And allows souls to gain awareness of their condition here in the union state, but also potentially to gain awarenesses and also create more universes of a higher hierarchy and exist in those universes as well. We've got no idea what's ahead of us, right? No idea what's ahead of us. Yes, so let's look at the unaware soul. The unaware soul exists in the same location, of course, because the soul can only exist in the soul universe. But it's unaware, it doesn't know it exists there. So right now you don't know you exist there. The unaware soul remains within the soul universe 
while connecting to the two parts of the body. So remember, this is multi-dimensional space, so that is easily possible. Dimensions enclose other dimensions, so this makes this possible. Mm. Now, the, 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 one of the instinctual processes of the soul is that it must connect to these bodies in order to learn. And, and the reason why is there's too much for the soul there to learn without going through this baby process growing, this learning process, this spirit world baby process growing through the spirit world. There'd be too much to learn all at once if it was just here without those bodies and without that awareness. So God's created a very a nursery for the soul. And your nursery for the soul is your physical body and your spirit body. That's your nursery for the soul. Uh, it's actually the body itself, this physical form, is the nursery. The, where, the universe that contains it, of course, this physical universe, is its playground. So that you can learn how to use your soul in the long run. That's the purpose. Of course, all of this is so that you can begin to understand the infinity of God and also begin to understand the infinity of God's love as a part of your being. God, that's the reason why God did it, so he could share love with you, share his experience with you. Very remarkable thing to have a creator desire to have its creation share what it feels. That's like you creating a car and the car knowing what you feel. Right? Not just in intellectually deciding things, but feeling what you feel. Right? And, and not only that, being self-aware. Right? Amazing creation, really, the human soul, isn't it? So the physical and spiritual bodies are required by one half of the soul who is in an unaware state in order for the soul half to experience the physical and the spiritual universes so it can learn. The half of the soul needs to learn a whole heap of things first before it can merge with the other half of the soul or become aware of its actual existence as a complete unit. And so it has to go through a lot of experiences to do that. And so God's created this playground, this physical playground, and which includes the metaphysical, the spiritual universes, that the spheres that we've been calling spheres, so that you can, as a half of the soul, play and learn until such a point as you start learning about the other half of yourself and how there is a necessity to become aware and how the emotions in between the two halves function that cause a lack of awareness or full awareness. All right? So it's a very powerful process, allowing this unaware soul to become a fully self-aware being. So it allows the soul half to be educated about love, interdependence, masculinity, femininity, and a huge number of other topics, so that eventually it becomes aware of the other half of itself and loves the other half of itself and joins with... And, and remember, this is all uh, removing the blockages to the uh, imagined state. So at the moment, you imagine yourself to be separate and you're removing the blockages to that state so that you can now b begin to see yourself as you actually are, a completed being who's, un uh, who's not yet aware and you start becoming aware that, oh, all we are is a completed being that's not yet aware, so now I can work with that. I can start looking at what emotions inside of Mary and what emotions inside of me prevent us from going through this joining process. And remember, desire activates it all. So I need to be driven by my desire to discover it and my desire to do it. Yeah. Transformation principles all operate on desire. Yeah. Important to see that. So the union condition is the condition of being completely self-aware as the unified soul. So now we're no longer unaware that we're this two halves joined as one, but now we are aware that we are and we work with that. We, we now are able to utilise that condition in order to enjoy our function. Right. But the physical and spiritual bodies can't exist in the soul universe. Obviously, they are lower creations. They have laws governing them that limit them from experiencing this soul universe. And in fact, 
their, their point is, is void in the solar universe. You don't need them to exist there. But if you want to express yourself still here and actually have interactions with other people, you can create them if you need be in order to have those expressions. So, so if I if, say I'm in this union condition, I want to talk to somebody on Earth and they are aware, I'm not, try, I'm not changing their life through the interaction. In other words, I'm not through my interaction causing their will to be severely affected by my choice, then I would make the decision to, if you knew I could do that, I could do it. Does that make sense? Come and talk to you in a creative body, talk to you, off we go. Create another body, talk to you. Create 100 bodies, talk to you. 100 people at the same time, if you want. The soul is capable of simultaneous communication to thousands, if not millions, of, of other souls. Right? In a self-aware state. So it has the potential to create hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of bodies that it uses to interact with other people in the physical because it can't yet interact with them here because they are yet to be self-aware. So it's quite interesting in that state. You can look at another soul that's not self-aware because the two halves are unaware of each other and you can trace down the chains that actually have the energy flow from those half of the soul to that body and that spirit body and now that you know who they are, you can talk to them <laughs> without them even being completely aware in their soul union condition that it's happening. Right. This gives you the ability to share truth and share love and share other things with them and educate them even though they are not a self-aware being yet. Does that make sense? Yeah. David, you'd like to ask? Thanks. When we are in the unified state and we wish to travel to spheres of a lower condition, do we separate into different spirit bodies? Well, um, and you, you're saying if you're in a unified state and you wish to travel to anywhere in this physical universe, mm -hmm. do you have to... Do we separate to do that? Since, or are we still collectively in one spirit? No, body? the one soul controls those bodies. You could choose a male body or a female body because that's the only two options you've got. <laughs> that makes sense? Okay. And, uh, and, but it's the soul, complete soul in a self-aware state controls the body. So if Mary chooses to do that in that aware state i'm really choosing it as well and if she chooses if she's the seed of the if, of the desire then she will create probably a female body form to to express that desire but i'll be completely aware of every conversation everything that's going on every feeling that's going on every feeling in the persons that are communicating and remember this is multiplied by hundreds and hundreds of people you might be communicating to at the same time this, this soul has the capacity to process information at much more rapid speeds than we have the ability in our brain to process information in the physical. The spirit body has the ability to process information much more rapidly than the physical brain does. And so too, the soul has an exponential, exponentially greater capacity to transmit and receive information. So it can maintain hundreds of physical forms and also at the same time through the laws which it now understands because it's a self-aware being, it can, it can create these forms and interact with people in the lower areas of the universe under the hierarchy and interact with those people at real time for those people here. So you can have a hundred conversations all happening at the same time with a hundred different people all at the same time and be completely so aware of every single conversation, what you're saying to every single person and what the feelings are of every single person while you're communicating with them and they don't realise that that's going on. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Thanks. Very powerful condition, obviously. Yep. Now, we might leave a lot of your questions to the question, which is question and answer, which is the next session. I've only got now about 15 minutes and I just want to make sure that I do cover all this material. So, in conclusion, the human transformation principles are the most highly complex principles governing God's laws and God's highest creation. They create laws that exist outside of all current universes and also outside of any new potential universes that could exist through the progress of the soul. 
Right. So you can see they're pretty powerful laws. Right. Desire for and reception of God's love is the human controlled mechanism by which transformation of the soul into a divine creature occurs. You have control over whether this is going to happen to you or not. And the transformed soul becomes completely self-aware, is assigned the gift of immortality and has the potential for infinite expansion and expression. We don't know how much that soul it will expand, how many more universes might need to be created for its expansion to survive, and we don't know what the final expansion and expression of that soul may be. Because given an infinite God with an infinite amount of ability, we don't know how much we can approach the infinite. Of course, you're not going to get started <laughs> unless you have a desire. <laughs> And you're certainly not going to get started if you don't are not self-responsible. <laughs> you see, can you see? Can you see the? Uh, you can see that many of the penalties of not engaging the principles are beyond our conception to even examine at this point. You see what I'm saying? Many of the principles and the penalties for not engaging them are. Like we are ignorant of the majority of them. We're not saying the majority. We're, inf we're ignorant of billions of them potentials. Therefore, we don't know how much we're limiting ourselves just by not having a desire. So whenever you choose to not have a desire, whenever you choose to not live in harmony with love, you have no idea at this point how much that is stopping you from the enjoyment of the rest of your existence. And this is why we need to have a lot more trust and faith in God and in God's infinite capa capacity to, to generate things for our happiness. Yeah. So why, why are we sharing these things with you? Now, it seems beyond like your conception, right? But it only took myself and Mary 2,000 years and some others 2,000 years to get from this earth-based condition to that unified self-aware condition and 2,000 years isn't a long time it's like how many 20 100s isn't it an average lifespan on earth close to 100 and it's just like 20 average lifespans on earth and you could be in that condition and that and there's people who are there who have been there less than that right So it's not that far away as you might imagine, but can you see if you don't have a desire to understand it all and get there or enjoy the process, or even have the faith that every new condition is going to bring you far more benefits than the current condition is possible, possibly able to give you. So what, what I see a lot of people is they go, here on earth, you know, if you talk about something like sex on earth, for example, most people imagine that to be the most blissful sensations that you can experience, right? Don't be silly. <laughs> like, don't you think that this soul in a union condition has a far greater sexual sensations than you could ever imagine trying to have two bodies here on Earth experience? Of course it does. So, so, so if you're into sex, then surely you would want to engage this process of expansion. But I'm saying to you, if you're in any good feeling, surely you'd want to engage this process of expansion. Do you see? But we're so limited, we're going, oh no, I'll lose my physical body. If I lose my physical body, there's a lot of nice things that I might lose. We're not going, but maybe God's got a whole heap of better things that I might gain. We're not, we're not thinking that, right? Because we don't have faith in God's goodness. We just are thinking about what we're going to lose. So it's like you trying to give up an addiction. You're going, oh, I'm going to lose some things there. I go, what? 
<laughs> How can you conceive you're going to lose something when there's all this to gain? Like, what? What are you thinking? You see? There's something wrong with our thinking and, and it's driven by this underlying feeling, is it not, that maybe God is not good and maybe every new state is going to be a subset of the old state. Do you know what I mean by a subset? What I mean is that you go like, yeah, in my physical form I can have sex, but as soon as I'm a spirit, I can't. In other words, the next state is more limited than the current state is what we believe. You know, I know my father, when he, if he ever thinks about the spirit world, he's going to say, but I can't ride motorbikes. <laughs> and I'd go, if you can't ride motorbikes, but you can fly, which one would you prefer? <laughs> or you can't ride motorbikes, but you can, you know, you can go between two, you know, two universes in, a, in, in, the, in an instant. Which one would you prefer? You know, like, you know, we've got to start seeing that that the, we're judging everything from the limited condition we're in right now. And this condition being our first visit, our first uh, place that we visit, every single being, who every single soul visits on earth first, uh, we then start becoming attached to it and thinking that it's the only thing. What a mistake. Transformation principles guarantee it's not the only thing. They guarantee it. But it's driven by desire. Purified, sincere desire. Can you see the necessity for purifying and having a sincere desire? Can you see every time you resist having one and you just get firm and you go, oh, just because someone told me off now, I'm not going to have a desire anymore. Just because as soon as we do that, we just cut off this as our prospective future. We just cut it off, bang, it's gone. We need to learn about desire. We need to learn how to purify it. We need to learn how to develop it, how to engage it, what to do about it. We need to make sure that we do these things if we're ever going to engage a better place than we currently have. And I'm not just talking about, I'm talking about even if this earth was absolutely perfect, there was no war, there was no sin, everyone was happy, everyone was with their other half on the planet and all of that, it's still better in the spirit world and all that. Do you understand? And it's still much, much better, like, and I can describe some things in the spirit world, but won't bother because it's too hard for you to even imagine at this point, but it's much, much better in the soul world, in the union state, than it is anything that you could ever achieve in the spirit world. So why wouldn't you continue trusting that God's got something better around the corner? Right? rather than thinking that, no, it's all just a subset. It's all just, it's all just limited things. So, so we start on the earth and we have a good life and then we think, oh, no point dying, because if we die, it's just going to get worse. Life's going to get worse. And God's created it so it gets better, and you believe it's going to get worse. So, of course, now we're resisting dying as much as we possibly can. We're trying to not die, pills and potions and whatever else, while at the same time we're suppressing all of our emotions about death, which actually causes us to die more rapidly. So we end up dying anyway, and then we arrive there and we go, hey, this ain't so bad. Yeah, There's never been a spirit who's felt that the spirit world is, a, is just the same as the earth. There's, all the spirits feel that the spirit world is better and there's only one exception to that, and it's those spirits who have engaged their will to sin, their desire to sin, in such a magnificent way that they have to go through a heap of correction in the spirit world before they enjoy the spirit world. But even those, after they've done the correction, always feel it's better. So we can then presume, can we not, given God's infinite goodness, we could presume that surely the next state is better again. And surely the state after that is better again, and so forth. And even the states that we don't even know about at this stage are going to be better again. Right? The transformation principles guarantee it. 
Guarantee it. Lovely. So, what do we do? We frequently justify, minimise desires, attitudes, emotions, thoughts and actions that oppose transformation. And this is what we do. Rejecting God, we reject God's love, we reject God's proof, we reject God's principles and laws, we reject having faith. Remember, faith is desire. You need it in order to engage these things. And we, we reject it. We go, oh, I don't have faith. Who knows? Faith doesn't work. What's the point? It's just an imagined condition anyway. We reject the potential of a spiritual afterlife. How much of the human race does that? This life is all there is, so do what you damnedest, you do your damnedest here to get what you can get, right? All the while sinning and creating a worse afterlife. And this, but this is how we engage our life here. If we knew there was all these potentials ahead of us, would you start, wouldn't you start planning for the fact that you're not going to be here as long as you thought? Or maybe as long as you thought, but nowhere else? You, you start planning for the fact that you're going to be somewhere else in your future. Agnostic or atheistic beliefs. Agnostic beliefs meaning I don't care what's going to happen. <laughs> what? what? Of course you need to care about what's going to happen because it's going to happen. <laughs> and you have control over what's going to happen. So what, you definitely need to care about what's going to happen. And atheistic beliefs, atheistic beliefs preventing me from progressing anywhere beyond the sixth dimension, not, not 36, but six dimension like surely like you really want to limit yourself like that why don't you why don't you deal with why you've got atheistic beliefs why don't you work through that emotionally religious beliefs in disharmony with god's love and truth man the earth is full of them art is it not i was talking to a guy last night he barged in after the group seven day adventist man wanted to tell me about the fact that we were wrong and whatever and and so we're talking and he's he's there He's there telling me, you know, about all these religious beliefs that are in complete disharmony with God's truth and love. Of course, I can't believe him. And I'm saying, look, I, I'm just going to have to agree to disagree with you. And he kept trying to bombard me. I said, and now you're even being loving. He said, I know I am. And I said, doesn't that bother you? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm trying to be loving. <laughs> to tell, I'm trying to tell you that, y you know, you're wrong. I said, but I'd never asked you whether I wanted to know whether I was wrong. And that breaks the law of free will, which you said there is a law of free will. You actually said it, I said to him. And now you're trying to overcome it in me. You're, you're sinning. You're, you're in disharmony with love. You're being unloving. And he said, I know I am. And what did he do next? Try to tell me some more. <laughs> so in other words, he knew he was unloving and... He doesn't understand the seriousness of the sin. Doesn't understand it, right? And in the end, I had to remove him. I said, you are so unloving, mate. I'm just going to have to ask you to go. That's how unloving you are. I can't even talk to you anymore. Mm. So he went, fortunately. <laughs> Willfully engaging unloving behaviour. That's what he was doing. Thinking he was right, righteous, self-righteous, whatever. But willfully, he knew the behaviour was wrong, but he couldn't help himself. He had to engage it. Doesn't that sound like us sometimes, right? Yeah. Even desiring ignorance is a... You're placing so many restrictions on your soul by desiring to not know something. You're far better off desiring to know something than placing restrictions by not knowing. Like... Yeah, there's so many things here. You know, we got lists and lists and lists, and we could keep going for the rest of the uh, day and probably into the following months and years, right? Listing all of the different things that cause us to no, not engage the transformation principles. Believing I am God is one of these ones, one of these new age concepts that have been considered, you know? Arrogance, narcissism, desire to hold on to current self-perception, holding on to emotions that resist the reception of love from any source. And that's resentment, right? Holding on to resentment. All of these things are having a huge impact upon the rest of your long-term existence. That's how serious they are. You've got, no, like I said, you've got no idea how much not engaging the transformation principles affects the rest of your existence. 
obviously, if the transformation principles are the highest universal principles that can exist, right, in terms of what they govern, and you're not engaging them, you must be breaking the most powerful of all laws that are going to benefit you. Because remember, God never makes a law that doesn't benefit you. So you've got to be breaking those laws. And therefore, there must be severe consequences. And when I say severe consequences, I'm not talking about hell-based consequences. I'm talking about severe consequences for the rest of your existence if you don't engage them. I'm talking about what you actually lose, not what is imposed upon you to correct you, but I'm talking about what you lose. What you lose is far worse than anything God would ever impose upon you to correct you. What you lose is far worse because that, that has a much greater effect on your long-term happiness. So this is why transformation principles are so important to understand and engage. And they are so simple to engage that it doesn't make any sense for us to not do it. But we don't do it. We're pretty illogical sometimes, right? And we don't do it because we don't really trust that God is that good. That's why we don't do it. So you can see that any injury, emotional injury with God, we really need to address them, don't we? Any one of them. We need to get rid of them as rapidly as we can. We want to address this issue of why we're not transforming. The benefits of transformation far exceed any other sin you can engage in terms of the negative results of not engaging transformation far exceed any other sin you could engage and yet and by the way every person in the sixth sphere engages that sin so, so they are severely limiting the rest of their existence through their own arrogance yeah so it should be should it not that any person who does not see the need for us to connect to the infinite God must therefore bear the consequence of that lack of connection. There is an automatic consequence of not connecting, which, may, which means we remain the limited being that God originally created us to be. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what we're going to do, that's, so that's the end of this uh, presentation, Transformation Principles. Obviously, there's so much more we could talk about there, right? But what we'll do is we have a break now for one uh, half an hour. So we come back. If we come back at one o'clock, that'd be good. Oh, sorry, two o'clock. We're going to do a Q&A on this subject. Now, I think the Q&A we've got lasting an hour, so we've got opportunity now to ask quite a lot of questions that have come up through the discussion and uh, we'll spend an hour answering those questions and then we'll go move on to our final presentation with you. So uh, if we can come back at two o'clock that would be good, that gives you 25 minutes for lunch. Sorry guys. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <coughs>